from Instagram is about uh, a short burst of, in- of inspiration, effectively. That's what you want in your photo. Either that short burst of inspiration or something that gets you talking and, and commenting. Business of Architecture, episode 234. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. As a podcast listener, get free instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy-to-customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today, my colleague Ryan Willard takes the mic again and interviews celebrated London-based designer and renaissance man Adam Nathaniel Furman. Furman has become a bit of an Instagram sensation with over 18,000 followers on Instagram who follow his work and posts. Also, I encourage you to go over to his website, check out his amazing work at adamnathanielfurman.com. It is quite remarkable. I've never seen anything like it and is very distinctive, and I have a feeling that people in the future will be looking back and talking about Furman and his impact on the world of design. Now, before we jump into today's show, I'd like to invite you and ask you a question. Would you like to be behind the mic here at the Business of Architecture show? I'm looking for proposals for conducting an interview that would be of incredible value for our audience. And if you submit one, I'll consider it for inclusion here on the show. This is your chance to make an impact on the ongoing dialogue about architecture through this podcasting medium. And heck, it's just kind of fun. So here's what to do if you'd like to take a shot at this. Send an email to me, enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. Tell me who you will interview and why you are the right person for the job. Any other details that you'd like to include about why I should pick you, send that over as well. I really hope that you take this opportunity. I look forward to hearing from you. Now, here's today's show. Brilliant. So good morning and welcome to the Business of Architecture in the UK edition. And I'm here with the inspiring Adam Nathaniel Furman. Have I said your name correctly? Absolutely. Brilliant. Hello. <laughs> and I'm here in your amazing studio come apartment, which is just filled with the most intense, brilliant collection of architectural tomes and monographs and books and ceramics and, ceramics <laughs> and just all sorts of incredible collectibles. And some of you may know Adam because you probably follow him him on Instagram and Adam is quite an ins- you've got your fingers in so many different pies in lots of different things and I think what you're doing is really it's just unique and I think it's very like inspiring and refreshing to you know what we were just talking about before we started recording just hearing about your ideas on architecture on being an architect so I suppose to start the conversation I'd like how would how would you describe yourself Ah, <laughs> so I I can't call myself an architect because I'm not yeah. registered. But um, obviously, I'm deeply embedded within architecture, and I studied architecture. I teach architecture. I have have taught it. I run a research group at the Architectural Association, um, and I work on projects that can be described as architectural in every way. But um, I refer to myself as a designer just simply because I think it's it's a it's more of a catch-all. Yeah, it doesn't have a title, a legal title associated with it, and it it encompasses everything from the design of a mug. Obviously, I've got these mugs on sale at the moment at the Sony Museum to um, research to um, the design of buildings, yeah. facades. Um, so it's just because it's an all-encompassing catch-all phrase. Yeah, so I call myself designer. And so you've got lots of kind of you know, you know activities of like entrepreneurial activities from. It just, just explain a, a few of the. Th- different things that you're that you're doing um and then i want to talk talk to us about like your social media presence and how you kind of how you built that up um so in terms of my activities i um i currently teach i'm a i'm a tutor at central st martin's architecture so that's a nice sort of grounding annually sort of keeps me keeps me going to the office every week um and being inspired by young young students um i also am a journalist so i write for various publications Mm -hmm. which keeps my my brain ticking over um i try particularly on on that to be uh positive 
uh, reviewer. I like to share um, inspirational things rather yeah. than criticizing. Um, so I tend to accept commissions for projects that I know that I've got something to positive to say about it or to contribute to. to. Um, I also um, do quite a lot of research. Um, I think the side of that you see coming out on social media. So yeah. a lot of that research just sort of like ends up on Tumblr and in Instagram um, and people enjoy that very much. But that's also turning into concrete things like a book which I've got coming out for Reba called Revisiting Postmodernism, which I've written with Sir Terry Farrell. Yeah. Uh, so that's coming out at the end of this month. Um, the research I mentioned, a research group at the Architectural Association, looks at color as is a sort of active agent in architecture and urbanism. Yeah, and we've we've been running events and holding symposiums and publishing research texts for the past six years. So we've got like mm. quite an amazing archive online for that. Um, as well as um, in my own practice, which is myself, and then I work with uh, freelance people on various projects. Yeah. I do installations, just had Gateways, which was a pretty successful installation at London Design Festival. Which and looks absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah it was, th the public responded so well that King's Cross asked to keep it for a few days, actually, Brilliant. after the event, because um, sort of by and that was a, general a, a agreement. That was collaboration of Land of Ceramics, was it? Or? Turkish Ceramics. Turkish yeah, Ceramics, they're, yeah. They're, their Twitter, their, their Twitter and Instagram handle is Land of Ceramics because someone else has Turkish ceramics. Right. Yeah, it's the it's the it's the national body that represents the all Turkish ceramic manufacturers in the country. Yeah. Turkey. So they got, and that's the second biggest manufacturing country in the world for ceramics. So they right. got clout and they've got good good funding and they're really they've been really good good to work for. But I also do interiors. Yep. Um, I'd love to do more. So basically anything architectural. So currently I've got interiors projects. I think which someone of my age is quite common to yeah. start with. Um, and uh, as well as doing product design, um, and whatever, whatever comes my way. Really. Yeah. And it's all got your kind of unique stamp, like your sort of <laughs> expression. Yeah. Your I, colorful. I think some, that, that's been, that's been quite good. I was just talking to you before about the fact that I have worked for other offices for a very long time yeah. and on the side I've done my own projects. And I think part of that was that. Um, it allowed me to be very selective in the projects that I chose mm. to accept or that I chose to go for. Yeah. Um, in the sense that rather than desperately needing work because I had to sort of, you know, get money in. Yeah. I, I like living well. Um, <laughs> it was a matter of does this client like what I do? Do they like my proposal? Um, well, um, or, or, you know, is it is it a particular brief? I didn't want to do kitchen extensions. Um, is it a particular brief that I find really exciting where I feel like I can push the boundaries that's mm. of, of, a, of, of my aesthetic, which is going to be good for my portfolio? Yeah. So I can yeah. be really selective. So what, what that's allowed me is over the past eight years to build up a portfolio, which means nobody at all is ever going to come to me as a client yeah. expecting to get a John Pawson interior. You know, so it's actually now allowed me to get and, and work so, in. And so that was kind of developed as a result of you kind of work whilst you're working at other practices yeah. that kind of always gave you the safety net so you could be be that selective. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah because I, I didn't need I didn't need it. Yeah. Practically speaking. And actually and I and I was very lucky that the practices all the practices that I worked in were like hugely supportive of, of me doing my own work not just me also other people in the offices so and it was also because i've worked for kind of i think practitioners who are quite creative as well yeah. now and also when they were younger and they, they also had unusual parts so uh, for instance when i was working at ron arad there were <coughs> quite a few of us in the office who'd be actually almost actually everyone for instance on my part <laughs> of my side of the desk we were all doing our own projects and ron was like super supportive of it so it was also being in an environment where everyone else was doing something similar. Yeah. Um, and we all, and we were all doing the same thing in the sense of we were using our income to kind of, you know, kind of keep us happy. Yeah. And then using our free time to keep us even happier creatively. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Brilliant. And, and how have you, how have you been using Instagram? So, so that's a lot how, how I've been kind of following your work was mm. kind of, I saw this intense Instagram that had the most fascinating selection of images. And I was like, I've got to talk to this guy. And then, like, you know, it, it's you've got, like, an Instagram following of, you're saying, 16,500, mm -hmm. which is the kind of following that lots of architectural practices would absolutely, like, yes. kill for. <laughs> kill for, exactly. So many people want want to know. And it's actually, I mean, what, I mean, what I'm particularly happy with is that it's, um, it's a very good group of people following. So yeah. I tend to get big bumps of people following because someone recommends it, and yeah. then most of them unfollow. So, and I retain only, like, and it's mostly architects and designers 
with an open mind rather than like people who want clickbait or just want kind of like large photos of repetitious facades that look pretty yeah and don't give them information that's what i think so i tend to because of the stuff i post and because there's so much of it i tend to weed out non non-committed uh followers <laughs> so i and so that i think that's that segues into how it's been really helpful for me in terms yeah. of my my work and getting commissions because it's a very i think i tend to get only really committed followers who are really passionate and that's led to um pe- the, the kinds of people following me who then get in contact because they actually want to do stuff yeah so tell us a little bit how you started the instagram account how it began how did it begin i think someone joined for me because I, I was I I was saying that um, I I'm I'm a very slow adopter, but yeah. once I adopt something, then I sort of go a bit nuts. Um, so Facebook, my students joined me. Like I gave them my details, and they joined yeah. me. Um, and obviously now I'm like totally all over it. Um, and I think Instagram. I think it was my brother or something. Like, I'm not sure who joined who joined me into it, set up my account. And then I just very slowly started to feel my way through it. I remember for the first few months, like posting, I didn't understand what it was for. So I was like posting photos of a windowsill <laughs> that like looked terrible. But I, like, I thought that there's light and is it arty? Like, I don't know, like am I meant to post arty stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then like some railings and I had like zero followers for quite a long time. Um, and then I, I kind of cottoned onto the idea. And then I started to see, because I obviously followed a lot of people that I liked. Yeah. Um, and then I started to see what I enjoyed in other people's posts and learned from that. And and the thing that I enjoyed the most was on the one hand, people sharing uh, just just in a very boring way, in like an architectural historical way, sharing buildings that they saw mm-hmm. in everyday life. Yep. And they found out what it was yep. and then they shared it. And there was a little bit of like, oh, my God, did you know that this little building on this high street in Berkminster was by... Uh, Richard Norman Shaw yeah and it's just that little bit of joy that Mm. that happens or there was one account or there is one account of I can't remember his name but he he only posts and I I don't necessarily like accounts that only do one thing but he only posts photos of blind windows and it was just really (laughs) lovely it was just really lovely to follow that Um, and also there's there's like a depth isn't there to to those that makes it more interesting it's kind of like geeky obsession yeah he just loves them yeah and it's and they're very interesting, actually. Yeah. Like, and he, has, he finds stories behind them. Um, and then the other thing I liked was I, I thought that you could only post your own photos. Right. But then I saw that actually other people started, to, I saw people posting the stuff that they'd scanned mm-hmm. or stuff that they found online. I was like, oh, copyright? Yeah. And then actually, no, there's like basically no copyright issues on Instagram. You right. Just like basically post anything. Um, it's just super, super lax. So I was like, oh, well, what are the copyright rules then on that? That since they're just doesn't non-existent. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, effectively, you can just. You, I personally, whenever I know where an image is from, I, I post the image source. But very often, it's like a th- it's like a probably fifteen million times removed from a Tumblr. Yeah. Or um, if it's from if I if I scan it from a book, very often, like I just you know kind of put it in occasionally i'll mention the magazines from but I, I very very often will leave it if i post in other areas that are non-social media it's completely different yeah so like i yeah. cite I, I i the photographer and the copyright issues but no it's very it's very lax if it's from another instagram account obviously you just you have to yeah. say where they're from and yeah, yeah. it's a, a repost and if i but it, it's effectively social media has different rules yeah so i was like oh okay well then i can actually just start posting things that uh, I like or that I come across. Yeah. Um, and so my research then started to just bleed into it, into the page and I started to post things from what I was looking at, um, what I was researching, things that I scanned, things that I came across on the internet and just posting them directly onto the onto the account. Um, and that's where it kind of and clearly it was took bit, off. Yeah, it looks like it's become quite, quite an obs- obsession. Like it's... Yeah, well... And it's, it's epic. It's like it's really, really quite a fascinating thing to kind of engage with and and it was interesting what what do you think is the mistakes that lots of architects or designers or people do with their instagram accounts that make them totally unstimulating because the thing is i tend to not follow the unstimulating yeah ones, so it's it's difficult to say but i mean from the from the kind of corporate well corporate but like the kind of practices that i've seen who who post um, I think the 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 ones if it's like a smaller office or a medium sized office the only the ones that tend to really work are the ones where like perhaps the owner of the office it's like treated as their personal account yeah and there's like a lot of 
personal thoughts, sharing of, of events, uh, visits to uh, visits to sites, uh, little t- snip t- tit bits of like the creative process. So very personal, yeah, and quite a lot of quantity. Mm. Uh, the worst ones are where it's like Instagram by committee, you know, and it's like mm. we had the Christmas party, yay, <laughs> and. Uh, we just won uh, Architects Journal Interior Retrofit Award of the Year. Yay. <laughs> you know, and great. Yeah. And it's like once a week. It's kind um, of me-centric type of thing, but not actually showing anything. It's basically press releases, yeah. you know, effectively. And it's like, well, you know, we all get press releases in our email. Like, mm. We don't really, you're not going to follow that on Instagram. Instagram's about uh, a short burst of, in- of inspiration, effectively. That's what you want yeah. from your photo. Either that short burst of inspiration or something that gets you talking. And, and commenting and yeah the office christmas party or your aj retrofit award is not going to is not going to win you any fans yeah at all yeah. um and i was just saying that um the bigger offices sometimes i, I think you mentioned roger stuck harbor and i was talking about som yeah and boffill um they have more resourcing and perhaps the one who's the ones who actually allocate a staff member or a couple of staff members the responsibility of running the the instagram feed uh, who can really take ownership over it and who also have access to the archives and also yeah. have access to like current site visits and, and project photos they can be great like yeah. sometimes is really enjoyable because you're getting like history you're getting current stuff and they insert within that the corporate we just won the best award of the year for this and and then you don't mind so much because there's a lot of like kind of really interesting content yeah that, that's it's couched around and it's really it's really interesting as well because the can people when we consume social media, we're in a certain mind space or we're kind of, we've consumed so much of it that we know what we're looking for and it tends to be something that's just authentic. Mm. And when it's not an authentic message, it doesn't, it just doesn't land. Yeah, we have like, we have like whiskers, no? Yeah. We're like yeah. super sensitive, like that's fake. Yeah, exactly. That's forced. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, that was generated by uh, an algorithm or like uh, a poor, a poor comms person in an office who has no ability to be allowed to write for herself or himself. Yeah. And you're like, oh no, no, no. Yeah, no, exactly. That. Exactly, and like, and we're and we're super sort of sensitive to that. And when 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 it's not when that authenticity is not there, you kind of like your attention is gone. Yeah, that's it. And the, and then the media, the the feed or the posts becomes irrelevant and kind of like a well, people don't follow. Yeah, or they unfollow. So yeah, I mean, and particularly in architecture because our subject matter is not exactly dancing and singing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in its own right, you know. So I think extra effort <laughs> needs to be made to try and engage. Yeah. And, on a personal and, level. And, and how, how have you grown it? Because I know that you're involved in lots of kind of advocacy and like campaigns like for, for post-modernism, modernism, post-modernism <laughs> yeah. and you're involved in like, you know, just starting new conversations that perhaps are sometimes unpopular in the sort of mainstream architectural Yeah, they norm- I mean, normally, I think normally that's possibly why I'm drawn to them because yeah. there are vacant spaces. Yeah. Right, because they're not popular. So that's why I tend to start these conversations. Yeah. And, that, and all of that has kind of helped you set up what is now your like would you call it a practice or would you call it just your way of practicing well it's my it's my practice but yeah. the practice is me and yeah and i work with and then i collaborate with people on individual projects but I, i'm an individual operator yeah um i think um so i think instagram is like where effectively like there's lots of conversations that i'm having we are having because it's like it's all sort of lots of people um and instagram is just effectively where this all comes together so there's like the visual material from various things i'm looking at researching and talking about yeah tend to come together and get posted on the instagram yeah. so it's sort of like you get it's the compost heap of it all comes together um but these conversations that i've set up so postmodernism, which was initially just a fight <laughs> and then turned into a conversation later on um the, a really important part of that has been uh the facebook group postmodern society which um has now just sort of exploded into this sort of like thing with fifteen thousand people and it's not as interesting as it was before where there were just like a thousand people who are having really intense conversations of, of a lot of depth. And still now there's like key, there's key members who are amazing. Yeah. A lot of them are not architects. It's actually really, really interesting uh, how, how non-architects who have an incredible knowledge about architecture have been really, yeah. really um, key to pushing the conversation forward. Um, so that's, that, that was very helpful. But then also a lot of advocacy in the press. So I wrote a lot of articles initially being supported by very few publications because nobody mm. wanted to write about postmodernism unless it was critical um and uh and bd was actually i think the first one who were really helpful in responding in terms of trying to campaign to save buildings because so um i think the the reason I, the reason i sort of like really came out and started advocating was because uh they started demolishing some really good postmodern architecture 
uh, particularly Terry Farrell's. And, um, you know, my point was, is like, we really don't have very much good postmodern architecture in this country. It's not like the United States where they're just awash with it. Like yeah, we have yeah. like eight good buildings, mm. we have hardly any. It's not like brutalism where there's great architecture everywhere yeah. because the state was building so much of it. So I was horrified by the, by the fact that we were losing some of them. So I just went full out advoca- advocating um, but, you know, so through legal channels also, because I, I was, I tried to list uh, Landmark House, mm. the Midland Bank building failed, but then there was an uproar about the language that was used by Historic England for not supporting it. And then, so then when we went, I went and then I, I lodged an application to mm. list Common Ching, which was being defaced. Uh, and then Historic England kind of had to rally behind us um, and um, got that to be the first postmodern building ever listed in the UK. And so that was a big campaign which went really well. And that was hand in hand with all the writing in magazines and hand in hand also with the Postmodern Society on Facebook, which was really helping develop ways to counteract arguments that other people were putting forward for like, why should we demolish these buildings? Why we should hate them? Um, Twitter was more like effectively trying to emolliate uh, sort of calm down the critics who refuse to allow uh, this kind of architecture or any architecture in this period to have any airspace. Yeah or to be respected in any way or to be taken seriously in any way and that 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 worked quite well i mean it never it never reached a point where there was agreement at all but it reached a point where there was a space that was allowed for these things to be considered not evil um <laughs> and instagram instagram initially was just this side thing yeah it's just like oh it's just like nice images and i started posting and then i was like my god i've started to get loads of followers yeah um and then i started getting messages about like potential work and stuff so instagram actually in, in many ways has started to become more of a, a much broader um ish um, sort of way of directing taste yeah so modifying broader taste issues so the other the other uh sort of areas media areas have been i guess to to do with changing the debate yeah discussion discursive textual to do with conversations um instagram has literally been about acquainting people with the qualities of a particular way of designing or particular ways because it's not only postmodernism i've also been trying to advocate for color in architecture yeah also been trying to advocate for classicism yeah and stealing it out of the hands of the, tr- the trad architects yeah and trying to show that it's a creative thing that can still be used as just as relevant and still as, applicable and it's got relevance and it's just yeah. as relevant as classical architecture it's yeah. just it's been stolen by the right wing yeah um and also edwardian architecture so there's kind of quite a lot of various things that have been coming together on the Instagram feed. And and it's been really nice to see how people from the beginning, like no likes on Edwardian buildings, no likes on uh, uh, sort of kind of postmodern architecture. Um, and then now loads. And, you know, it's because simply once people start seeing many of something, it's like, I think sometimes, you know, people, you know, come to a new city and all the buildings look the same. So, so my, my boyfriend, when he first came to London, he was like, everything, everything looks the same. <laughs> I'm like, really? Where's he, where's thought, he from? Milan. I, Milan, I was like, I thought, <laughs> Milan looks well, the same. Okay, it all looked the same to me in Milan, though. When I went there, and it's like, uh, and, you know, I think London is a city of great architectural diversity. But then, yeah. you know, it's because he wasn't, it, he's new to it. And then the more he's lived here, now he's like, oh, it's the most diverse. It's wonderful. There's so many different yeah. architectures. I wish we had this in Milan. And it's simply a matter of becoming acquainted with a context or a, or a way of designing that yeah. you then start to differentiate between all the small variations, right? And then it becomes a whole world. Whereas if from the outside you're only acquainted with brutalism or like neo chipperfield minimalism, right? You look at anything POMA, anything that has color, anything that's sort of complex, anything that uses collage, you're just like, Ugh, POMA. Yeah. You know, whereas actually there's an entire giant universe within that that once you start seeing many of them on a feed, for instance, yeah, my feed, yeah. you start differentiating between them and suddenly London becomes full of many different buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you are, you're essentially educating. It's like That's a, sort of visually educating. It's, it's like, yeah, visually yeah. education resource. Which but it is shows kind of... how, you know, there's people like who hilariously think that taste is not acquired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I've seen people's taste change. I mean, they constantly change. My tastes change. Uh, I'm just very aware. So like I, I don't shit on the things I don't like because I'm aware that my dislike, unless it's based on kind of practical operational functional issues, is likely to change in yeah. the future. So I'm kind of I'm kind of reflexively aware that that like my dislike is not objective yeah, yeah. to a certain degree. Um and so this is separate to issues of quality of construction, relationship to city. 
is aesthetic. Um, and so it's really nice to see how you can shift people's tastes mm. and that people start to become aware that tastes are changeable. Yeah. Um, and I can tell people who say, no, taste is objective. This is just bad. This is just bad taste. This is just awful, which yeah. I still get all the time. Even from like, really serious academics it's hilarious yeah. you know they're like they're still convinced that their aesthetic tastes are like somehow objective that this very much absolutely objectively proves yeah <laughs> that taste is acquired modifiable constantly changeable based upon social circumstances based upon what you see and what you're acquainted with mm. that's it that's so it's been fun yeah <laughs> yeah no and it, and it is it's absolutely because that is like you know in in that that's how you've kind of created this kind of dialogue and an audience which in turn, how how have people been approaching you for work? Then how is it kind of DMing? How, how long how long did it take for you to sort of for these for the for this conversation and your passions to turn into like to, into projects? And how and what's the sort of what's the future for your practice? How do you how do you in, envision it? Because um, it, it was interesting you were saying earlier as well about like it's you know, and I don't hear ar architects talk about this very often. Is like designing a practice which suits their lifestyle. Yeah, I'm surprised that you haven't heard that. Yeah, well, that's, I'm, that's I, the key to having a. Well, no, t totally, a totally, life. and I, and, you know, and I hear it in the sort of other circles a lot, like entrepreneurial circles, yeah. people when they're starting up the business. Tech, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about how to balance your yeah a good life with actually yeah exactly like being a lifestyle entrepreneur. You're yeah. designing a business because you want it like hands free. It's automated. It's digital. It's kind of online. You can live, work wherever you want. Yeah. Whereas in architectural circles, sometimes we get a bit kind of you know we only think there's one way of running a practice. Yeah, I was talking to someone the other day. I was like. The model of well, there's many models of practice, but it was just, we were brought up. We were just brought up at the at the AA with a particular model uh, of practice, which was the kind of Zaha Farshid Musavi yeah. model, which was um, you kill yourself for your job. You're yeah. Like you don't sleep for a year, <laughs> and your your interns have to go to psychologists after after they finish the project, <laughs> and uh, you know you you divorce because you can't have a normal family and. Uh, it's it's simply not sustainable in the sense of why do it because you you know why even design something that requires that if it's going to kill your life and mean that you won't be able to design more in the future yeah um and i think there's very much amongst i mean i hopefully amongst my generation very much with with me yeah a desire to factor that lifestyle aspect into both the designs that i do Mm. And the way that I, the, the, the commissions that I accept and the way that I work day to day. Yeah. That, that, that's not what I do. That like I manage to produce things that I'm happy with, but also I have a lifestyle which allows me to have uh, time free. Yeah. Uh, uh, time with my partner. Yeah. Time with my family. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, and, and that I don't, you know, end up an emotional wreck. Yeah. Or dying at 55. Exactly. And as, and as you say, when that balance is present, then the work is better. Like, no, I'm not sure. I, no, I, I wouldn't I, say I, that. No, I wouldn't say that. No, because I, I absolutely, no, no. I think it, it just ma it makes for a nicer, it makes for better offices, it makes yeah. for better human beings. Uh, but no, I mean, Zaha's. But a foreign office's building is brilliant. Absolutely. It's yeah. just, my God. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I remember when I went to see an exhibition at the ICA, that place that doesn't really do very much anymore. But <laughs> back in 2002 or three or something, there was the exhibition on the Yokohama Ferry Terminal building. Yeah. Um, incredible project. Have you? I don't know if you've visited it. I've never visited it. But it's absolutely brilliant. It's one, um, one of those projects that is often like in somebody's studio in the architecture school always open yeah. on that page or some, you're like copying details off it. And yeah, unfortunately it's like non-reproducible because again, a project that like killed them. Yeah, um, yeah. And there was the exhibition on it and they, they proudly, because again, there was this sort of culture when I was growing up in architecture of like showing off how much work. Yeah. Right? It's not... It, there were like I think it was 1,500 pages of drawings and they mm. just had this stack I mean it was a mountain of drawings mm. <clears throat> as if that was quality yeah you know it's like they didn't even show it's like you, you walked in you didn't see the building you saw this stack of drawings and it was kind of interesting it's like the building's brilliant doesn't doesn't need that you know and actually I as far as I'm concerned great art should look effortless yeah right yeah. it's not it's, it's like it's like a jewel yeah or a watch that because the design's shit, it has to show off, which Yokohama's not shit, but it's just in principle, right? These luxury products that have to show off the amount of work, like this insanely overly ornate amount of craft that goes into like the back of the watch yeah. that's left 
clear so that you can see all of the hours that you're paying for. Mm. So it's a quantitative thing rather than something about the quality of the design. Yeah. And like, for instance, that project didn't need that. You yeah. Know? It was brilliant design. So, you know, like, for instance, in my work, it's actually like it's the opposite. It's a matter of how little drawing can I do to make something really good. Yeah. Can I Photoshop a scribble? in conversation with a contractor instead of producing a whole new set of drawings. You know, it, it, that, that, that's effectively yeah, like just, the way it's, I Yeah, it. it's much more like actually... Can I, I FaceTime with the, with the contractor? Yeah, it's much more about the communication. Um, yeah. And getting the idea expressed. Yeah, and, then and getting not it beautiful realized. or either beautiful construction drawings or drawings that are just like quantitatively like totally unnecessary. It just screams of, uh, it potentially screams of a kind of inefic inefficiency that could be mm. possibly... Avoided, and similarly at OMA, there was a culture of <clears throat> you couldn't leave. Like the, the less you slept, it was a kind of very macho culture. Of the, the the less you slept, the cooler you were. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I've been in offices in the past where, and it's not the officers' fault. It was just it's just a kind of communal culture that had developed over the years. Sort of people would be sitting at eight o'clock, twiddling their thumbs and like clicking around on the internet because they just felt that they had to be in the office mm. and they'd like stay until ten for no reason. And in OMA, like it was the same thing. Like I first day, I was kept until four a.m. Uh, I was kept until 4 a.m. in the office, and it wasn't really because any work needed to be done. It was just this sort of culture of producing huge quantities of work. Yeah, somehow, yeah. Because you just had to do it, and it was, you know, eight, 98 percent of what what I did there didn't turn into anything. And again, it's not a it's not a critique of them. It's just I think there's it's a, a gener generational shift, yeah. possibly. That's just like that was great, and an amazing stuff came out of it. But possibly, uh, again, like in tech, I think there's been a shim similar shift. So what so what do you think is the sort of shift for young architects, people coming out of university? Um, what would you advise or what kind of like guidance would you suggest like to break away from that kind of culture or for like setting well, up practices think, or for like think, or how do you how do you see the, the future of the profession kind of I think there's been a changing really, there's been a really nice shift generally so like I think you know this this my attitude is part of a much broader change there's you know do you remember that great campaign that was led by I think I mean numerous people but I think BD and AJ and lots of independent uh, uh, practitioners against unpaid internships. Oh yeah, yeah. So and that you know I think we've forgotten about that debate, but it was it worked really well. Mm. It was amazing, and and I think there's this notion that there well, there's an understanding that for first of all on on that on that side you're locking people out on lower incomes because like work is work, and you can't effectively subsidize officers by through the parents of interns which is what it was happening and on, and on well i mean it was yeah. i mean that, that's, yeah. that's that, that was the business model i mean that's i i've i've heard there's you know still star architect offices around the world that still operate in that way but it's become so ethically unpalatable mm. in britain it doesn't i think as far as i'm aware it really doesn't happen here anymore yeah from places um, like in japan it's much more it's a commonplace thing for it to yeah you know, i mean japan is a cultural it, thing so yeah like it's it, it's almost all offices there yeah but i think I think big does it, but I and someone someone told me the other day that I, I don't want to say names because it's just, yeah, yeah. that's just hearsay. Uh, whereas in Japan, I know it's a cultural thing generally, uh, but I know that here it's not. It's changed massively, and I saw that, for instance, when I was working in Farrells. Like it's you know they literally treat their part ones and their interns as employees, yeah, fully. Um, and I mean I don't want to go into details, but it's it's great there, and I know that it's the same in most other major offices now, and even a lot of medium sized and smaller offices. So on the one hand, there's that, which is fantastic, but also there's an issue of working culture, which has changed. So from my experience of the offices I've come across, I'm not sure what it's like in small design offices, mm. like, I don't know, 6A or Cruiser St. I don't, I don't know how they are now, but in a lot of uh, medium-sized practices, um, the, the, the kind of extreme late-night culture has really reduced. And I think there is an understanding, for instance, that like uh, a lot of younger people need to have a life right and they they there isn't this need for them to sort of sleep under the desk and stuff so the late you know all nighters do happen yeah we it's just because our profession our profession is inherently inefficient right we're creatives <laughs> fundamentally although nobody likes to admit that so there are always going to be terrible late nights where decisions have been made late we've gone through 15 options and that's fine but it's all the stuff in between and, and i think that that's very much reduced as far as I've understood. Um, and so, I mean, talking to my students in St. Martin's, uh, you know, now they're kind of going out looking for uh, offices. Um, I really do uh, ask them or, or suggest that they check, speak to other people who've worked in an office before and ask about office culture. Because I think more than mm. more important than the, the design an office produces is the office culture of how they treat mm. their staff. Yeah. 
um, how they deal with responsibility. Yeah. Um, and what and and sort of just what the environment is like on a human level. Yeah. And again, this is so. I think about these things for me myself when I'm working by myself now and what projects I take on. But I'm also very highly advising my students to to uh, send their antennas out beforehand so that they don't end up in situations that will make them hate architecture and be depressed, which yeah. happens. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Your, you spend all your you spend all your hours in that place. Yeah. No, and that's it's 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 a it's a concerning trend that it, that ha- that happens, and it's kind of like how to mitigate against it and have people empowered in their choices and where they want to go and how they want to kind of express themselves in the world of of architecture yeah i mean going you know offices i I think offices are so much better than than they were before which is great um but like 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 you say i think um do you do do i'm just gonna say do you you find a lot of your students are actually um they're quite sort of entrepreneurially minded or they're kind of they're kind of they realize at university that there's lots of other ways that they could make a living from architecture or like they're engaged in different things online and they're you know selling drawings for example like i mean i've seen a lot of students who are kind of doing things like that where they start actually monetizing projects from early on is that something that's kind of like a popular trend or is it um well i mean i teach in one university yeah well i'm involved in the not kind of involved in the a because of the research cluster i think you know Students are way more business savvy than they were before, which yeah. is which is great. Um, but I think the majority still very much, uh, which is good because the profession needs them. Is you know they they want to go and they want to leave leave go to an office, get a placement, uh, do their part three, um, which is great. I teach intermediate, so then they'll they'll do their part part one placement, then come back and do part two, and then do part three. But um, I think sort of broadly broadly speaking, most people still want to go down that route. But I think there are a few very very keyed up students and it should never be more than that because obviously the, the majority of the profession needs to go and work as, as kind of architects project architects um but there are sort of the 10 percent who are through social media because before it was much more difficult to, to see people who were doing things differently through social media very aware that there's other models that they can follow but I, it's difficult to say models because there's no clear tracks so i was talking to one particular student who i adore um <laughs> <laughs> on tuesday um and you know, she was, you know, um, you know, saying, oh, you know, is your your route something I can follow down? I was just explaining to her, I think, look, study what I've done, study what other people have done mm. who have gone down different routes mm-hmm. and different paths. But because she's a sort of very creative person, has a, like most creative people, has an unusual particular mix of things she's interested in. They're never yeah, the yeah. same, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, don't copy it. But be aware that maybe you can pick cherry prick some of the things that some of us have done. So, for instance, I've my career was very helped um, by uh, having the design museum residency. Yeah, hugely helped. I mean, it's like that's that sort of helped kick everything off. Uh, the British School at Rome, Rome Prize. Yeah. Um, so there's these there are these things that have along the way given me kicks. Um, and other people I know have similarly had uh, kind of had bursaries or won prizes uh, that have really helped them go down the mm. particular route they wanted. So I was telling her, like, research those, look for bursaries, mm. look what other people have done and find the ones that are relevant for you. And then once you get one or two of those and you start going off in your own direction, you'll find your own journey. Your own footing, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's about 10% of students that through social media are aware that there's that architecture is not just grumpy old men and you know on the part three panel yeah telling you your crap um and telling zaha she's not an architect um <laughs> it's it, it's possibly many other things yeah um, and it's quite it's quite interesting and it would be nice to see the profession embrace that which it doesn't yeah yet and you you were saying actually you made an interesting point about how you can see the profession going in the uk either one of one of two ways yeah i mean it's, it's a debate that's happening in the yeah. at the moment it's been happening for the past like four years but um yeah i mean on, on the one hand it can retrench and it can go back towards the, the the way it is in most other countries which is a sort of professionally protected title situation which is yeah. highly controlled where the practice is pr- protected as well as the title because there's obviously in this very weird situation where the title's protected but not the practice practicing of the profession um or uh we can sort of increase the Venn diagrams of the, what's included within the understanding of the architectural profession and start to start to embrace people like myself. There's a mm. lot of us who are doing unusual mixes uh, of work within their career, but that all falls under the remit of something that is considered architecture yeah. role. Yes. Whether it's architectural yeah. discourse, architectural production, 
whether it's interior design, but kind of people who have come from architecture and branched out slightly. That it, I think if they increase what is considered architect, I think it, then they take ownership over the new directions in which the new sort of diffuse directions in which the mm-hmm. the practice of building and making is going. And I have a feeling, I personally think that if that was codified, mm. that would be a hugely empowering thing for the RIBA, for instance. But I do as, mean. Uh, hugely empowering in the sense that it starts to represent a demographic or a group that is growing in prominence and power and relevance economically, yeah. rather than one that's absolutely shrinking, disappearing, unable to find its place, even within like really standard construction projects and, you know, um, design groups like you know the architects got a massive sense of identity crisis yeah um, so I think there's you know it's not throwing out those roles of the architect the traditional roles but like adding new ones yeah just and, expanding what it is that, and yeah. defining what those are and how they how they relate to each other and I think that would empower the RIBA because the, that part of the profession is growing so much yeah yeah so I think it would be very very good for everyone yeah, and there is, and I know that there's discussion about this. They're talking about affiliate memberships and all kinds of things, but it would just yeah, it would it, further it along. Yeah, yeah it would re- it would be really nice if they kind of actively pursued that in, that broadening of the understanding of the profession. Brilliant. And they don't have to necessarily use the title, right? The title can stay, but it's like who who's part of the who's part of the group. Yeah, yeah. No, and it sh- and it shows like it, it puts architects. It does it. It will do a lot of value for the title architect, knowing that it's kind of much more multifaceted and engaged with lots of different areas and disciplines yeah i mean it, the, the title I, i'm not necessarily mean the title the title doesn't have to broaden but it's like these affiliations yeah. could be really good for the title yeah, of yeah. Architect. and it's you know yeah, it's like exactly. having it's like having backup right you're not alone yeah totally <laughs> the whole look we got a quarter of the creative industries are part of our ken right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i think it could be i think it could be exciting and really positive and i i see there's so many practitioners i see who are like this um and i think there is a big but i think you know the core of the industry understandably mm. you know like taxi drivers they want to protect their uh, their economic um area yeah right um you know for instance you see heatherwick right the way that he's being he's obviously obviously being attacked now because of the garden garden bridge catastrophe but um even before that people were just desperately waiting to tear him down desperately i mean you just like they were just literally like chihuahuas waiting for yeah. like, someone to walk past so they could just attack them um, and you know you can just see the glee with which the architectural profession has piled in on just tearing his reputation apart because he's an outsider. Mm. He's an affiliate person who yeah. works in architecture, but you know he's done wonders for yeah, yeah, totally the way that British architecture and I say architecture is seen by the rest of the world. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, totally, totally agree. Just broadening, broadening the the horizon and sort of having a more all encompassing. Yeah. Thank you so much That's okay. for talking to me. It's been absolutely fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And Thank you. Me. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.